What's up, my friends? Matthew West here. When I decided I wanted to do a podcast, all I knew were two things. One, I was passionate about the power of a story. And two, I wanted to get those stories to the people as quickly and easily as possible. And guess what? That's where Anchor came in. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. It's so easy that, well, I can use it. First of all, Anchor is free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Like I said, easy. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Listen, Anchor is everything you need to make a podcast in one place. That way you're not getting bogged down by all the technical stuff, all the details. You can just focus on getting your story to the people. Build your next podcast with Anchor by downloading the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And remember, Anchor, so easy that Matthew West can use it. Hello. 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 Hello, my name is Matthew West and I'm the host of this podcast. It's called the Matthew West Podcast. I really You guys, I'm going back on the road, and that means I'm going to be on a tour bus with a bunch of guys. Now, I want you to guess what a tour bus might start to smell like after a weekend of shows. Late night pizza, buffalo wild wings, I mean, sweat. It's it's not a pretty, pretty thing to imagine, but that is where Simply Earth comes in. Simply Earth's Essential Oil Recipes box makes it easy to master essential oils at over $150 in value. You get four full-size essential oils and all the ingredients you need to make six natural recipes, all for just $39 when you subscribe. Now, these natural recipes, they help make the air on our tour bus clean and toxin-free, but they also smell amazing. No scent of pizza anywhere. (laughs) Now, here's my favorite part. These are essential oils that change the world. I'm going to get essential oils for my family and I somewhere. If I can get it from a company that I know is making an impact in the world, I want to be a part of that. Here's what Simply Earth does. They donate 13% of their profits to help end human trafficking. I'm going to say that again. 13% of their profits go to help end human trafficking. So when you subscribe with Simply Earth, you're helping to end human trafficking too. These are the purest oils on earth. It's like one of those meal subscription kits, but way more fun. Do these recipes work? Every single recipe is created and tested by AHA certified aroma therapists. In other words, you're not going to get a recipe unless they love it. These oils have no synthetics, no fillers. It's 100% pure. They've been tested and they're 100% pure, so you're only getting the good stuff. Here's what I want you to do. You can enjoy a home or, in my case, a tour bus free of toxins. Go to simplyearth.com slash west and use the code west to get a free $20 gift card with your first recipe box when you subscribe today. That's simplyearth.com slash west and get a $20 gift card with your first recipe box today when you use the code west and subscribe. Simply Earth, these are essential oils that change the world. Join them and change the world too. Hey everybody. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Matthew West Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew West, and as always, I really hope you like it. I'm really excited for today's show, but truth be told, I'm also a little bit nervous, and here's the reason. For the first time on this podcast, I am going to be addressing my song, Modest is Hottest, and the controversy that surrounded that song, and I've invited a special guest to join me for this conversation. I'm going to tell you why I chose her in just a moment, but first, I figure I should start at the beginning in case there's any listener out there who's not familiar with the song or the controversy. On Father's Day weekend, I released a funny song, satire, called Modest is Hottest. Now, if you follow my music for any amount of time, you would know that 
making up funny songs is kind of part of what I do, especially during the pandemic. I felt like the Lord was calling me to just uh, lean into my sense of humor as a way of bringing some levity to some heavy times. You know, our world's had a lot more reasons to cry than to laugh over these last 18 months. And so I would write songs like Quarantine Life that went viral and people got a good laugh out of. And then at Thanksgiving, we did a song called Gobble Gobble. And, you know, the West family got a kick out of being a part of these songs. And it was so much fun to kind of bring about some opportunities for individuals and families to to get a laugh during some some hard times. Modest is Hottest is a continuation of what I love to do. You know, for every truth be told and what if, there's a funny song that hopefully just puts a smile on somebody's face. Now, in this song, I jokingly try to convince my daughters that the latest fashion trend is not crop tops and short shorts. It's actually turtlenecks and sensible pairs of slacks. Clearly a joke, clearly satire, poking fun at myself for being an overprotective dad, kind of like the country song where the dad's saying to the boyfriend, I'll see you when you get back here. I'll be out here cleaning my gun, that kind of thing, you know? Um, A lot of people loved the song. It started to get shared like crazy. But then, as is often the case, the critics came out, and the critics' voices were much louder than those of the supporters. I'm talking about over 26 million impressions for Modest is Hottest on TikTok. Um, It was unbelievable. Now, as a songwriter, you would give anything for that kind of exposure for your music. But in this case, a lot of the response was was just flat out hateful and vile and vulgar and wishing harmful things to be done uh, to my family. And and so today we're going to talk about not just the heart behind the song, why I released it, but also why I ultimately chose to pull the song. And I'm going to talk about some of the response I got from Christians after pulling the song. We're going to talk about all of those things. And I've just tried to be slow to speak and quick to listen. And that's why I've waited until now to do so. I listened to several people weighing in on the subject while I was being quiet. And I found a podcast episode by Allie Beth Stuckey. Her podcast is called Relatable. And what I found myself relating to in this episode that she dedicated to the song Modest is Hottest and the topic of modesty, she kind of presented a a very well-balanced argument, why people would be offended by the song, why sometimes the church has failed people. But at every turn, she pointed to the truth in scripture. And that's how I want to live my life. And that's how I would want to conduct a conversation about this song and about the topic of modesty. And so I asked her to join me on today's show. And I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. And so without further ado, we're going to go there. And there's going to be no songs from the story house today, no dad advice. This is just going to be all about this conversation, and I'm thankful that she's joining me today to give me a chance to re-enter this conversation as a dad who loves his kids. I love Jesus. I want to stand up for my faith, Um, and uh, today we're going to talk about all the things modest is hottest. So let's go to the story house with Allie Beth Stuckey. Allie Beth Stuckey is in the house. Now, Allie Beth, we call my studio here the story house because I'm a storyteller and um, whether it's through the podcast I'm telling stories or through the songs that I write and I thought I would start by telling the story of how I found you and now I've become a big fan and I was I think I was like the last person to discover you I don't know why but everybody and their mother seemed to be doing or weighing in on this song that I wrote called Modest is Hottest and um, I was kind of getting a ton of heat for it And it was the song was satire. And we're going to talk about this a little bit today. But I want to let the listener know why uh, and let you know why I asked you to be on the show. Uh, I reached out to you on Instagram because I had listened to some different podcasts. I was trying to avoid social media, which everybody who's an expert will tell you to do when you're facing criticism, like that social media is showing the extremes, but maybe not the real world. Have you found that to be the case in your life as well? (laughs) Oh, that's absolutely the case. And a lot of critics that uh, you had after that song came out are, you know, also critics of me or at least the same kind of crowd of people. And um, yeah, it can be really toxic and it can be really disheartening too to feel like your words are taken out of context or you've got motives applied to you that were not in your heart and you don't feel like you can defend yourself. But it just gets too overwhelming if you do try to take up the sword and to advocate on your own behalf, because you just can't fight all those battles. They're everywhere, and you just don't have the ability, the omnipotence, the uh, omnipresence to be able to do that. So you do just kind of have to step back and say, you know what? (laughs) 
I, I, this is not my responsibility right now. Right. James 119, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And I found those taking those words to heart in response to all of the criticism that I was facing, but also just dealing with it and trying to listen, trying to learn. And I came across your podcast, and you dedicated an episode of your podcast, Relatable, which is a great podcast, by the way, and I'm going to encourage all of our listeners to uh, go and find yours as well. By the way, you are the first episode of year two for the Matthew West podcast. Wow. So well, I'm um, honored. This awesome. is very cool. But you, there was something about the way that you approached the topic. Um, there were a few things that I was really struck by and really inspired by because I pulled the song down and we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the reasons why I pulled the song down. But after pulling the song down, I still felt like there was going to be a place where perhaps now I'm uniquely equipped to re-enter this conversation that I really kind of naively did not realize I was entering into in the first place. And so without the song being the the point anymore, perhaps at a time in the future, I could re-enter this conversation from the perspective of a Jesus-loving American dad with two daughters who's just trying to do a good job trying to raise his daughters right and trying to look at what scripture has to say about that because that is my guide for life as well as parenthood. And when I listened to your podcast, one, I thought it was in a lot of everything I've heard from you on every topic, you seem to always strive to be well-rounded in giving both sides to an argument. And then what I heard you do on this podcast was at every turn you pointed back to scripture. So you talked about, here's why some people took issue with the song. Here's why some people supported the song. Let's go to what the Bible has to say about it. And specifically, there was one comment that I wrote down that I wanted to read back to you. And you said, should there even be a conversation about modesty, what we wear or what we don't wear? You said, I think there should be because the same God who pours out grace and forgiveness on us, no matter what we've done, the same God who sees us, who sees their children as righteous and holy and good, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done through Jesus on the cross, that same God does have something to say about how we present ourselves and how we dress. And you went on to point to scriptures like Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, Ephesians 4, 22 and 23, reminding us to put on the new self, 2 Corinthians 6. 18 through 20, flee from sexual immorality, reminding us that our bodies are a temple. And you just, I mean, it was powerful. And I was actually like here, I was kind of outside of myself and was forgetting that you were actually talking about my song and you were just covering this topic at large. And after listening to it, I just felt like I want to have a conversation with Allie Beth because one, I feel like I could learn something. Two, I feel like uh, you might help me better articulate what the Bible has to say about the topic of modesty, and just for us to have a conversation about how crazy it is to navigate our way through this world that seems to preach tolerance and yet have a really hard time practicing it. Yeah. So you said something a couple minutes ago that you didn't really know that you were entering into this bigger conversation that's been going on, not just about so-called purity culture and modesty within the church, but evangelicalism in general. And you were making a satirical song, which I thought was very clever and very funny that I really think that 10 years ago, even maybe five years ago, if it had come out, no one would have batted an eye. There wouldn't have been any controversy about it. Everyone would have understood the intended message and the intended audience. But unknowingly, you entered into a very political, ideological conversation that's been going on about um, what is called purity culture for a while patriarchy, feminism, all these things that we're not necessarily used to talking about in an exclusively church setting, but now are being talked about in a church setting. Right. So if you go into that sphere of talking about something like modesty, you've just hit a political topic without even realizing that you did. And that's why I think sometimes it's surprising. You're not a political person. You're not really wading into the political sphere very often, if at all. <laughs> um, but from someone from my perspective, who talks about politics and culture a lot and who hears a lot of the arguments from people who profess to be progressive Christians or just progressives in general, I knew as soon as I watched your music video, which was again, very funny and uh, listened to the song, I knew exactly what the backlash um, was going to be and what some of the criticisms 
would be. And like I said in my podcast about this, I understand criticisms uh, about purity culture and how we learned about sex. I grew up in the SBC, still in the SBC now. And a lot of the things that I hear from critics of purity culture are very familiar to me. Some of the damaging messages that we heard from youth pastors growing up, putting the responsibility exclusively on women for men's lusts and you know what they think about and all of that. So I'm familiar with some of the criticisms, not necessarily that they had specifically of your song, but just, you know, purity culture in general. But what I have seen, and especially what I saw in some of the critics of um, of Modest is Hottest, is people just throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying, well, you know, mm-hmm. I'm a child of God. I'm a daughter of God. He doesn't care what I wear. He doesn't care about that at all. That's legalism. That's pharisaical. That's... um which I just think this is demonic, but we actually hear this from these same critics. That's that's rape culture. That's what I saw. Right. And I imagine, I, I can't even imagine how like hurtful that is to hear as a dad of, of, of daughters. And it's just, it's just terrible. And so that's why I made the podcast episode that I did just to say, wait, wait, wait. I understand some people's hurt. I understand some people's experience that maybe this song unknowingly was a trigger for some people who had a hard time with purity culture, whatever it was. I understand that sinners and abusive happened in the church in the name of purity culture. I get all that, but God cares about it. And here's what scripture has to say about it. We can't just go run in the other direction and pretend like God doesn't care about this because he does. Yeah, I thought um, I was really shaken up by when I started seeing terms like when it took a step past purity culture towards rape culture. Yeah, that shook me because I was like, whoa, whoa. And uh, there were many moments where I felt like people were sometimes it's the blessing of music and the curse of music. The, The upside and the downside is that people are you know, listening to music and then they're applying their own narrative. They're finding their own story in a piece of music. And in this case, some people had, you know, chapters of their story that they would consider to be damaging ones by something that happened to them from a church leader or a doctrine that was taught or whatever. And there were just a lot of times where I just felt like I wanted to shout from a top of a mountain, I'm not your dad. I'm not your I'm not your youth pastor. I am not that guy. Like you're you're heaping all of this baggage that you've got onto me as a result of this song that you're now associating with that. So what made you do the podcast episode in the first place? Were people asking you cuz at the beginning of the episode you yourself said you had hesitated to do a podcast. I'm curious what tipped it, you know, over the edge for you to actually just dedicate a show to the topic. Yeah, your controversy gave me some gave me some content. It gave me a reason <laughs> to kind of wade into it um, because people have asked me a lot. Can you talk about modesty? And the reason why I hadn't dedicated a podcast episode to it yet is because I have found it difficult at some points. And maybe this was before I really dug into scripture and really thought about it all that much. It's hard not to come across as legalistic to say, okay, this is exactly what modesty is. This is how high your neckline has to be. Here's how long your skirt has to be. So really people asking me about it because of what happened with your video made me stop to think, okay, how do I approach this? I just find that this is like so clarifying with any subject when I'm looking at scripture and especially when I'm afraid to talk about something that I know is culturally or politically controversial. I think, okay, where is the gospel in this? Not just particular verses, which is fine, but where's the gospel in this? And how can I get people to think of this in a way that's not negative? So in the sense that you can't wear this or you can't do this, but this is what you do to the glory of God. So how can I explain this in a way that says, okay, this is how we approach this subject with the mentality of how can we give God the most glory possible? That's how I approach controversial subjects like abortion or uh, marriage, sexuality, gender. It's not just what the Bible says not to do. It's not just the rules that the Bible sets, which are all good and we should follow, but it's also what the Bible says is the most glorifying to God. And a heart that loves God is not looking at the Bible and saying, how can I get away with X, Y, Z? How can I look the most like secular culture that I possibly can while still making it seem like I'm a Christian? It says, no, how can I completely, totally surrender myself to God and glorify God as much as possible? That's what I want. So when it comes to what we wear, when it comes to what we say, people ask me, for example, um, you know, what does the Bible say about cussing? Well, I do think that the Bible speaks to cussing. There are some verses, especially in Ephesians, that talk about all of our words building each other up. But 
it's not just about, okay, you can't say this word, but you can say dang, or you can't say shoot. It's not really about that. It's okay. How do I give grace to those who are listening to me in a way that glorifies God the most? And that is true about modesty too. And once I realized, okay, this is how I can approach that topic, not from a place of these are the rules, but realize that modesty can also be translated into humility when you're looking at the text and realizing that is like a gospel characteristic of someone who loves Jesus, then it speaks to the heart. And of course, that's what Jesus did in his ministry. It's not that he said sin doesn't matter and what you do doesn't matter and outward righteousness doesn't matter. He said what matters first and primarily is where your heart is. Yeah. And so I think some people say, well, because Jesus, you know, came along and looked at the heart, um, he didn't care about, you know, what you did or what you wore or how you acted. Well, no, that's not true. He still cared about those things. He actually took the definition of sin to the next level by saying it starts with the motivations for why you do what you do. You know, man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. I mean, all throughout scripture, he's saying like, this is what I want. I want your heart. I want, and and then everything else will be an outpouring of, of the change that I'm making in your life, in your heart. Can we get some definitions out of the way? Because it sounds like you grew up Southern Baptist, SBC. All right. I grew up Assemblies of God. Purity culture, I felt so foolish for not seeing the blowback coming. Like I just, you know, I don't know. I've been in church my whole life. You know, I'm a preacher's kid. My parents taught me the importance. They always encouraged me to pursue the path of purity. I remember they gave me a a ring, but I never found it to be like this damaging experience in my life. But I mean, I think there were those kind of warnings as a kid growing up just saying hey Matthew you want to save your body and and God has great plans for you to enjoy sex within the context of marriage and the more that you you know experience that outside of God's intended will like every other part of life there are going to be consequences to that but my parents were never short they were never heavy on the guilt and shame message they were heavy on the reality message while also saying that God is a God of love and a God of grace. So I don't think I ever grew up. I grew up being told, Hey, save sex for marriage, save yourself for marriage. And if you don't, there will be things that you are going to have to deal with in your life that you might not have to deal with otherwise, because that is the case with any time that we step outside of what God's word says we should live our lives, but also at every turn saying, but God is a God of love. God is a God of grace. He's a God of second chances. So I never felt like anything I ever did outside the context of marriage was going to have, I felt shame, but shame from knowing I made a choice that wasn't what God intended. And yet at the same time, I was always brought back to this place of grace. So let's just talk about purity culture. Is that a new term, a relatively new term that, you know, that progressive Christians have created? Because I, I see it as like biblical. It's just another term for biblical values or we yeah. just like the word. We love the word culture, don't we? We like, love it just, the word culture. You why, can put culture it? after anything and it becomes like this nefarious narrative. And I would say that a lot of the criticism of let's not call it purity culture, whatever it is, purity preaching from the church and from, you know, church youth groups has become very narrative driven that if you had any negative experience within the church or you had, uh, there was any teaching about purity that you didn't like, then that was a form of trauma that then characterizes all of evangelicalism as this evil patriarchal place that puts the responsibility for purity on women and thus excuses men when they're, you know, gross pigs and assault women. And like you said, like I said, I'm sure that was some people's experience. I would never minimize someone's experience, their experience with abuse, especially with someone who is in a position of religious power and can use Christianity as a form of manipulation to shame a woman into being a silent victim. I know that that's happened. I believe that that's happened. And yes, I could see how someone is so speak out against that. Yes. Yes. And I I could definitely see how someone could associate teachings about purity with that. But again, going back to what we've already said, if the God that we know loves us so much that he sent his own son to die for us, if the God who as first John four, eight says is love. So everything he says is love. Everything he does is love. Everything he says to do or not to do is done from love. 
And if he tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, that our body is not our own and we're to flee sexual immorality because he bought us with a price. And if 1 Timothy 2 talks about modesty, then that means that those rules and those parameters and those boundaries were also set for our, because he loves us and for our well-being. And so unfortunately, I think because some people had bad experiences with so-called purity culture or the church, they have decided that that characterizes any teaching on purity, any teaching on modesty, any teaching on sexual immorality, and that You know, God just wants you to be liberated and free. But of course, we know as parents, we're both parents, that the parent who loves their child sets parameters for their child because they love their kid and and they want to protect them. And the same is true when it comes to our Heavenly Father. You know, so one of the inspirations for the song, if not the main inspiration for me writing Modest is Hottest was TikTok. The Cardi B song, WAP, was like just off the charts, you know, number one song, right? And if you watch the Grammys, like the her performance to the song, it was like, you couldn't have my kids even watch it. But here this song is trending on TikTok, right? So these songs trend on TikTok. I'm sure you're an avid TikTok user. I don't I'm know not, not. I'm but. not on TikTok. I've never <laughs> been on TikTok, actually. I've okay. never been on the app. But I know a lot of people like your kids' age are. And kids my age, right? My youngest is 12 years old. So I was seeing there would be, 10, 11, 12 year old kids doing dances to these, whatever sound, whatever song or sound is trending, the kids might not even paying attention to what the lyrics are saying. But in that particular song, I mean, that song is graphically um, describing female genitalia and just, I mean, off the charts, obscene when it comes to graphic sex. And for a 12 year old kid, to have that song's being pushed in their face because it's trending and popular, then these certain dances are being encouraged. And then if the parents aren't watching, the clothing is not. And like you said on your podcast, the reality is we are not saying that men are not responsible to control themselves and control their thoughts. We also know that we live in a sick world where there are online predators that are looking for the very types of images that these social media sites like TikTok can be actually promoting by trending a song like that, encouraging the youngest of the young to dance to songs like that. And so for me as a dad, watching my daughters, like having to navigate that with them because it's like, hey, is there a healthy way to use this technology that doesn't suck you into this type of activity? And do you know your worth enough to know Like, what is behind that? What's behind, like, dressing skimpy, dancing to Cardi B on TikTok? Like, whose attention are you trying to get? For what reasons are you trying to get that attention? Do you know that you don't have to do that to receive love and affection in this life? And the irony was, as I sat down to write that funny song, Modest is Hottest, as a way of letting them know, like, you don't have to do these things in order to find true love and affection that God does look at the heart and some and another man or boy who's going to love you for you isn't going to need to be attracted by those types of means and then i wound up getting attacked as if i had said the very opposite thing and so it was interesting cuz tiktok was kind of the inspiration for the song and it was as if as a dad it was like i was way off base And people were saying, no, you should be able to wear whatever you want. In your podcast, you said something that I thought was pretty interesting. As a parent who loves their children, I won't finish your sentence, but can you elaborate a little bit on what you thought, like, what does love look like as a parent raising your child? Yeah, well, one of the, I saw someone like make some kind of critical parody of your song and basically talking about his own daughters and how if his daughters want to dance on TikTok in a crop top, then they should just, you know, go off, do what, do what they want to do. Because that was a lot of the criticism. You know, girls should be able to wear whatever they want to wear. And actually, around the same time that your song came out, there was this viral post by another youth pastor who apologized for thus far um, making the girls in youth group wear a one-piece swimsuit. And the comments were like, yeah, you know, girls should be able to wear whatever they want to. And he actually said in his post, which I just thought was so sad. He said, girls, wear whatever you want to, and boys, stop being disgusting. So apparently now we can switch the shame. We can switch the shame. And shame boys. And shame boys for having, you know, normal, you know, 
normal reactions to we're talking about teenagers here yeah my point though in bringing that up and bringing up the criticism that i was just talking about of the youth pastor who said that he would let his daughters wear whatever they want to my question is do you really mean that you mean whatever they want to whatever you're saying that there are no boundaries whatsoever if your 13 year old wants to dance on tiktok go to the mall do whatever in public you are telling me you would let her wear whatever she wants And of course, the answer is, well, no, I'm not going to let her go outside or dance on TikTok in her underwear. I'm going to have some parameters. Okay. So you're already admitting that some rules are okay. And I would ask you why. And they would say, you know, well, it's inappropriate or whatever. I'm just guessing this is what their answers would be. And I would say, exactly. So you're already admitting that there are some parameters that a loving, protecting parent would put on their children for the well-being of their child. Now, I think a lot of people just kind of jumped on the bandwagon and criticizing your song because it's, you know, fun to go viral and to feel like you're a part of something and to join the mob. It makes you feel virtuous. I think some people think it's going to protect them from criticism in some way. Um, But every parent, every parent who loves their child sets some kind of rule for their child, not just when it comes to what they wear, but what they do, where they can go for how long, all of that. And God created families to do that because the frontal lobe of kids is not fully developed. They can't think of consequences quite yet. They can't see into the future. They don't know necessarily the repercussions of all their actions. Parents do. That's why God set it up that way. That is not saying, just to reiterate, and like you have already said, that is not saying that girls are responsible for the thoughts, the lust, the predation of boys and men. Not at all. But guess what? When Jesus is talking about if you lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery, he's talking to men. Like he is specifically talking to men lusting after a woman. When we read about modesty in 1 Timothy 2, like we are reading a specific order to young women. So that doesn't mean that men aren't called to be modest and humble because I think they are too. Humility is a is a Christian virtue that everyone is supposed to take on. But we see from the words of Jesus himself, from the words of, you know, God through Paul, that there's a difference between men and women. There's a difference between boys and girls. There are differences in how the brain works and there are differences in how we dress. So if someone has a problem with that as a Christian, I would say take it up with scripture. It's not Matthew West's fault. <laughs> and you make a good point about like, you know, just the fact that we are acknowledging that there is a difference between men and women and boys and girls, even that is controversial. Right. Right now. People don't want to even acknowledge that. Yes. And I mean, like I say, that's a Genesis one issue. God made them male and female. That to the Christian is non-controversial, should be non-controversial. The most controversial message in the Bible is that God sent his son uh, to save us from our sin, that you are a, a sinner, a depraved person in need of a savior, that in order to be reconciled to God and uh, escape the flames of hell, that you need Jesus to save you. That is far more offensive than saying that there are males and that there are Females. So I always say, like, if Christians aren't willing to defend the Genesis 1 issue, then I have a hard time believing that you are going to be able to defend a far more controversial message, John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, the life. No one will come to the Father except through me. So, yes, it's controversial, but for the Christian, it really shouldn't be. In one of my, like, um, kind of many internal rants as I was dealing with the the criticism, I sat down and I wrote a new version to Modest is Hottest, and it was called Offended. And it said, uh, Dear daughter, it's me, your father. It seems the world outside is woke. I wrote a little song about a turtleneck, and some people didn't get the joke. So I took the song down, and the Christians came around, calling me a coward. And the the statement that I made, the haters still hate, and they tell me, on socials every hour. And the chorus says, because the whole world's offended, it's the latest social trend to form an opinion and then dig our heels in. We talk about love and tolerance, and then we go on the attack. The whole world's offended. I suggest you watch your back. The, um, (laughs) I obviously never released that. That's only, that's only for you, Allie, Beth Stucky. I like it. But what was interesting to me, you acknowledged it on the podcast. You said, hey, this guy pulled the song, right? And then 
I want to tell you the why in case you are curious. Uh, I know a lot of my listeners are curious, and so I'm just going to insert my own answer to a question that hasn't been asked. But they've asked me on socials, what happened when I pulled that song down, all of a sudden, all these supporters of mine came out and said, well, we don't respect you anymore because you caved. You're a coward. You didn't stand. Aren't you willing to, you're going to stand before the Lord someday. And, And these very like this legalistic kind of approach hit me as hard as the other. Well, not quite as hard. I mean, 26 million impressions on TikTok, everybody doing parodies to Modest is Hottest and sending half-naked pictures saying, is this modest enough for you? I mean, that was the ugliest. But the Christians coming at me and saying, I'm not following you anymore, I don't support you anymore, as if this song was intended to be any sort of statement of faith on my part. This song was not a hill to die on. For 20 years, I've been standing up for my faith, singing about Jesus and telling a lost and hurting world that there's hope. And so I decided to pull the song down because the video so heavily featured my family, and it was being so grossly distorted that the irony, the heartbeat of this song, Ali Beth, was as a father, it was the heartbeat of a dad who loves his kids. And is the irony of the song, it, if anybody knows my family, is that I lose the battle when we go to Lululemon. And <laughs> we buy, they get the short shorts. Like that was kind of the funny part is that I'm a dad poking fun at myself because I'm trying to teach modesty and uh, navigating that path. But by no means am I perfect at it. And so when I pulled the song down, it was out of a desire yet again to kind of stand in the gap and try to protect my daughters. And yet it was seen by Christians as an act of cowardice, which is what left me feeling like, okay, I've successfully upset everybody. Yeah. And it made me feel like, okay, God, are you disappointed in me now? Like, did, was I, was this song, even though I didn't mean it to be, did you intend for this to be like my William Wallace Braveheart moment or, you know, my martyrdom? What did, what did you intend? And yet at the same time, my heart kept telling me, protect your children, pull this video for that reason alone. What would you say to that? Like, in fact, you know, it's it's almost like if I was going to expect anything, it should have been the criticism from those who would hate me just because I love God. Yeah. Right. But the ones who, who love my music and then came after me because they saw this as an act of cowardice. I don't know. I guess it's just, I don't even know how to ask the question. It's just, I wonder if you come up against that kind of thing as well. Yeah, that is social media and kind of like what you were saying in the beginning that you didn't realize that you were kind of waving into a moment. And some people probably saw it as, hey, I'm going to fight against, you know, progressive Christianity by making this kind of in your face video. Maybe some people saw it as that where you were not intending that at all. You were just making like a funny video, putting it out there. But because maybe other people who are more online or more political they knew that that debate is going on. Maybe they thought that you were kind of, you know, getting in the ring and you were fighting on their behalf. And then, you know, when you pulled it down, they thought, hey, like I thought I had a fighter when that was not your intention. I mean, you don't have to explain to me the importance of protecting your family. Like I am very serious about that. And I would have done the same thing if there were a video with my family that was getting distorted or they were getting targeted in any way. Like family just trumps it done. Like I would absolutely have made that same decision if that were the case. In general, though, I do advise people not to apologize when it comes to this kind of thing, because look, I've done the same kind of thing. There's a satire I did. You know, I talk a lot about politics and I did a satirical video with a Democratic politician. She wasn't actually in it. It was, you know, like if you've ever seen Uh, Like Stephen Colbert, Jay Leno used to do these like fake interviews with like George Bush and stuff. Well, I did the same thing and it was very funny and it went viral. And there were all of these bad faith criticisms of people saying that I was intentionally trying to trick people, that I was trying to make this person look stupid. And like all this evil intent was put upon me that was not intended at all. I mean, I had the Washington Post and BuzzFeed and uh, Huffington Post all reaching out to me being, you know, telling me what my terrible intentions were. And what I found actually was effective in that. That had nothing to do with, you know, people targeting, you know, my family or anything. So it was just me, people mad. I just doubled down because when I thought about it, I was like, okay. And I do think it's important to think about people's criticisms and to take it and to say, okay, are they right? Are they right? Like, let me think about this. Let me pray about this. But then if they're not, if you're like, no, I don't think that they are. I'm confident in this. I'm not going to apologize. I'm not. I'm going to double down on it. And I'm going to say, 
Thank you for everyone who really liked the video. Here it is again. Online mobs smell blood and they do not care if you apologize. Like you already said, you apologize to the same people who are criticizing you and parodying your video. They don't think any better of you. Now, I think it's right that you you know, put out a statement, you didn't apologize, which I thought that was good. You put out a statement, those people are still going to be mad at you no matter what. So your conscience, our conscience is bound to God. We do what glorifies him. If that means apologizing when we know that we're wrong, then we apologize when we know that we're wrong. We take something down that we have to take down. If it means doubling down on something that we know wasn't wrong, that it means doubling down. The bullies look for someone else to bully in a matter of like, two weeks. My friends, I am very excited about today's sponsor, the Glorify app, and I can't wait to introduce you to them. Glorify is a daily worship and well-being app that's revitalized my quiet time with God, and it's become impactful in my walk with the Lord. Now, this is ranked the number one daily worship and well-being app trusted by over one million Christians. Glorify is an easy-to-use tool for anyone who might be struggling with their daily quiet time. You get to grow in your relationship with God with curated, bite-sized Bible readings readings, guided meditation, and space to reflect and pray. Listen to exclusive content from Christian leaders like Sadie Robertson Huff, my friend Priscilla Shire, and Joel Houston. Fall asleep peacefully listening to a variety of bedtime meditations, declarations, prayers, and music. You can experience exclusive God-breathed music playlists from global worship leaders like Carrie Job, Torn Wells, Brian Johnson. Glorify will help you with structuring your daily worship, sleep, anxiety, stress, motivation, deepening your understanding of the Bible. Glorify your relationship with God now with 50% off unlimited access to premium content designed to help you get into good worship habits and grow closer to God. Download the Glorify app now. Create an account and enter code WEST in the profile section for a special limited time discount of 50%. Hey, can I tell you something that the West family is passionate about? Me and Emily West, we are passionate about getting our kids excited about scripture, about God's word. And that's why we love the Adventure Bible. And you're going to love it too. You can take your kids on an adventure through God's word with the number one Bible for kids. The Adventure Bible is available in five translations and a variety of colorful bindings too. Kids are gonna be captivated with the full color features that make reading the Bible and memorizing verses engaging and fun. Along the way, they're gonna meet all types of people, see all sorts of places, and learn all kinds of things about the Bible. Most importantly, they're gonna grow closer in their relationship with God. The Adventure Bible features captivating, full color features that get kids engaged with God's word. You get to live it. Hands-on activities help you apply biblical truths to your life. These are words to treasure. Highlights great verses to memorize. It is so cool. 20 special pages as well. Focus on topics such as famous people of the Bible, highlights of the life of Jesus, how to pray, and the love passage for kids, all with a jungle safari theme. You know, I think I'm just going to start reading this Bible. The Adventure Bible is recommended by more Christian schools and churches than any other Bible for kids. More information about Adventure Bible plus free activities and teaching resources are available now at AdventureBible.com. That's AdventureBible.com. Dot com. Check it out. I think it's interesting what you're saying about doubling down because I'm watching you now. You're running straight into the fire and you seem to be completely unafraid. And I want to know where that, where that comes from, where that kind of courage comes from. I think I already know the answer because I can tell you know your Bible and I can t- and you keep returning to scripture, but where is that coming from on a daily basis? And does it ever get, you know, wearisome for you where you're like, gosh, is this even worth it? Because you're, you're daily tackling a, you know, I'm just a singer, man. And I feel like, you know, maybe I don't have as thick of skin. It, at least that's what I kind of felt like I discovered upon this controversy was like, I just, it came out of nowhere. But where does this kind of courage come from for you daily to go, okay, I'm going to willingly enter into this, this controversial topic and I'm going to, I'm going to speak truth and I'm going to speak it in love and I'm going to be unafraid of the criticism. Yeah, it's been a process. I started doing this back in 2015. Well, it really started before that. Obviously, 
the courage itself and the love for truth. That's not to say that I'm the arbiter of truth and that I get everything right all the time. And I say what's true and what's false. I'm not saying that I'm the supreme authority on that, but my desire to seek truth and to speak truth when I know it and how I see it obviously comes from the Holy Spirit. I would say that it's a personality though, that I have always had. I have always kind of been this insistent upon trying to convince people of what I know is true, whether it's theological or political. That doesn't mean that I don't have a lot of friends that I disagree with and that I just let our disagreements be because I do. I have plenty of friends that I disagree with on a number of subjects that I don't try to always persuade. But when I can try to persuade someone and get someone to care about something that I want them to care about, like I'm just very passionate about that. And so it started really before 2015, I guess, that personality. But being in this realm of talking about culture and theology and politics, first I found that there just aren't that many women in that realm. And there are a lot of young women out there saying, what do I think about this? I mean, and I don't blame pastors for not talking about these things because you don't want to talk about politics all the time from the pulpit. But that doesn't stop people from asking like, what do I think about immigration? Like, what does the Bible say about gender and and sexuality and like socialism and capitalism? Like, I don't know how to answer these questions. And so I have tried to walk into that space. And what I found, the reason why I'm just, I can't say I'm totally unafraid because I'm not totally unafraid. It's a process. And there's like a decision that I make each day when I'm writing my podcast, when I come to a line that's controversial or something that I'm like, oh, people are going to be mad that I say this. I just ask myself, but is it true? Is it true? Is it true? And if it's true, then I have to say it. Not necessarily if it's unkind or something, but if something is true, and if I know that this is something that people are thinking, but they're afraid to say it, then I've got to be the one to say it. And you've got to give other people cover to say the thing that they're afraid to say to their friends. Courage begets courage. And so when you see that one person stand up and say the thing that you've been secretly saying, but you don't even want to say around your phone for fear that the woke mob comes and attacks you, um, then you start to get braver and you say, okay, so I'm not crazy. Just because those people are telling me I'm crazy, I'm not crazy. So now I feel like I can stand up and say the same thing. Well, and that word true... I mean, there's an important delineation here because when you say, when you're looking at that line, you're like, ooh, should I say this? And then you ask, your litmus test is, is it true? But your question, is it true? That litmus test is, is it true to God's word? Right. And that stands in stark contrast to when the world goes, is it true? They're saying, is it my truth? Right. Which, and in that sense... Like you say anything you want, it's my truth. And then if you say something that's true by your standards, which is, does this line up with God's word? Does this line up with what God says? That's the delineation there because everybody else is so focused on, here's well, here's what's m- what my truth is. The irony for me is just, like I said this earlier when we were talking about just the difference between preaching tolerance and then like, to me, I'm going like, why was it not possible for people just to disagree with that song and let it be an existing opinion in the world? Like, why was it blood or nothing? Like, why was it tear the house down, destroy the person, make sure he never sells? It? Like, what is it in our world that's making that be the only definition of a successful opinion shared, if I'm saying that the right way? Well, I think you kind of already answered it. When there are people who elevate their truth above the truth, then everything is personal. Wow. <laughs> like wow. everything, I mean, lived experience trumps any kind of objectivity. And objectivity is exactly what you need in order to have a productive dialogue and debate with someone so that I can say, oh, you're saying this, that's your perspective. Okay, can you tell me how you got there? Well, here's here's my perspective. Let me tell you how I got there. And you're able to have a conversation without attaching some kind of immorality to someone just because they might have a differing opinion than you. But this is like you just described the out for blood. I want to destroy this person's life. Make sure that they can never sell another album again. Make sure that their family feels afraid That unfortunately has been building for a long time, and it's not new if you look throughout history. Like if you look at the history of totalitarianism, especially in places like China and the Soviet Union, not to get too like political for people, but 
like you see, for example, in Mao's China, like cultural revolutions and struggle sessions where someone who said something that was an unpopular opinion, they would literally be taken out to the, into the street and they would be tormented. They would be spat upon. They would be, um, you know, canceled in today's terms until they were shamed into no longer holding that opinion or until they were killed or thrown into jail. We're seeing a very similar cultural revolution today to where it's even though the government might not be infringing on our free speech rights, we don't have a culture of free speech. We don't have a culture of free dialogue because everyone has become their own gods. Everyone has become their own arbiters of truth. And so if you violate someone's opinion, which they deem their truth, you're violating their identity. You're violating their trauma. You're violating their experience. And so Everything becomes personal, which means nothing can actually be debated about without someone accusing you of personally victimizing them. Wow. That's a really unhealthy place to be. That's an unhealthy place to be within the church if we can't yeah. have good dialogue with each other about theological differences or political differences. That's a dangerous place to be when we're debating political and, and, and social issues. And, you know, we hear a lot from the same people about the po- importance of democracy, the importance of justice. You can't have either of those things without debate and without truth, without objectivity. Social media has obviously exacerbated this, but there are a lot of contributors. And I think this is an opportunity actually for the church to be an example. This is how we have healthy dialogue with people. This is how we disagree with people. This is how we love one another through disagreements. This is how we detach our identity from our opinions so that if someone disagrees with my opinion, I don't think they're personally attacking me. So the church absolutely has an opportunity to show the world how to do that because like you said, people are lost in this world and it's making people very afraid. It's making people very quiet um, and it's making people act in really ugly and damaging ways. Yeah, you know, respect my truth, but I don't have to respect yours. And that's the crazy, the downside of this individuality that, you know, it's just, it seems so counter to what is being promoted. What would you say, because I think it's something really important about what you said about doubling down, about your willingness daily to keep coming back, say, am I willing to say this? I am if it lines up with the truth that I know, the truth that I believe, which is what God has to say. What would you say to somebody out there? Because you have, you've become a voice for so many people who want to know, hey, they're not alone in the way that they're thinking. They're looking at leaders like you. And even hearing you talk, I can understand a little bit better why Christians who were disappointed and let me know daily, I'm disappointed in your decision to pull that song down. I would say this to a lot of people out there. It's just in any time you witness something on social media or like, like in this case, me pulling that song down, I always want to challenge people. Just consider the very real possibility that you may not be seeing the whole story, right? right? Everybody's right. fighting hard battles. There's a lot going on that you may not be privy to. And if you knew what I was dealing with as a father trying to protect my kids now, you might not send that hateful message saying that you're no longer going to listen to my music. I'm just saying. Now, you may still know the whole story and still come after me, but I guess I'm understanding better now that people did want me to be a fighter and saw that song because it was getting so much opposition. They then associated me with oh, Matthew was making a political statement or Matthew was stepping into this conversation, not just with satire, but with some real heat behind it. And now it got hot and he backed away. I I guess what I'm saying is I'm really wrestling with, okay, now that I've pulled the song down, I feel this tugging inside of me to go like, you know, hey, I've been making music for a long time, but the Lord's blessed me with this podcast over the last year. It's reaching a lot of people. Now I've stepped into the fray unknowingly with this topic And I feel like more than ever, I'm being like challenged to go like, okay, what do you believe? And it's ironic because I've been singing about Jesus for 20 years. Like I know what I believe. I know all the scriptures, but it's like now, are you willing to stand up for what you believe? And my answer would always be a resounding yes, Lord. Yes. And then like, it's just so ironic that it's come to this goofy, funny song that I feel like is pushing me to this next place of awareness of going like, am I really willing to stand up for what I believe is right. And answer this question, Ali Beth, is there a place for a white Christian dad to speak strongly about what they believe anymore? I mean, it's, it doesn't seem very popular to be a, a white Christian dad. 
Well, look, the people that it's not popular among, will it doesn't matter because they will never agree with you and they will probably never get past, you know, what they disagreed with or what they didn't like in the song. But people are looking for truth. I'll give one example of something that I double down on that is very controversial. Yes, has gotten me in hot water, has a lot of people that hates me, but that I know people really appreciate because it's a very contentious topic. And so I'm just I'm just going to bring your podcast into controversy. <laughs> no, um, but, uh, you know, about gender and sexuality, an understandably contentious and controversial topic because it actually does deal with people's sense of identity. It actually is very personal. And there are a lot of people who like to be gray in this area, especially people who, you know, they consider that political or they consider that something that maybe we shouldn't even be talking about. And yet there are so many Christians that are saying, okay, but like, well, I don't know what to think of it. Like, I don't know what to make of this. I don't know how to defend this. And so they go on TikTok and they see, you know, stupid videos about uh, that God doesn't really care about those things and all of these lies and that becomes their worldview. And so if Christians who know the truth aren't willing to speak up and say, look, this is what scripture says, that we're going to get a lot of confused people. So we can't be so afraid of the mob that we're not willing to say that which is true. Here's another question that I ask myself. When I ask myself, is this true? Like, does the Bible say it's true? Does the Bible say that God made them male and female? Does the Bible say that uh, marriage between a man and a woman is reflective of Christ in the church and therefore it's representative of the gospel? Does the Bible speak to the importance and value of life in the womb? Yes, it does. And so if I am too afraid to say those things because I am afraid that it's going to sound bad, that it's going to be too harsh, then basically what I am saying in my fear and in my silence is that I can out-compassion God, that I can out-empathy God, that I Mm. need to be nicer than God is in the Bible. I need to soften it and water it down so that I don't offend other people. But again, if the God who is love says what he says and how he says it in God's word, my caveats and my nuance and my softening and my watering down is not more loving. I can't out love God. Like I can't out compassion him. I can't out justice him. I can't out truth him. So if he says something is true, then it's, it it might sound harsh to us, but if he is love, then he's saying it from love. And so if I am saying anything that the Bible says, that's already speaking the truth and love because God says it and God is love. And so that also empowers me that if God says something, it's also true. And it's also in love. And so who am I? It, it's pride. It would be pride for me not to also say it. It would be pride for me to make excuses for it. God does not need to be let off the hook for progressive Christians. God is not scared of the pitchfork mob. He is not scared of parodies on TikTok. He's not worried about that. Like he's the God of the universe. He's called us to be salt and light. He's called us to be ambassadors. Far be it from me to try to water him down to make him more appeasing to other people. That would be pride and ego on my part. And so that's something that I think also empowers me when I'm worried about talking about these controversial things, because I do too worry about it. It can be anxiety inducing. That's good stuff. I mean, if that doesn't light a fire for everyone listening to this right now, like this is it. I mean, this is what we're called to do, not just to secretly believe what we believe, but to be willing to stand up for what we believe. And and you're setting an awesome example of that and encouraging us on how to do that, continuing to return back. And like you just said, like, man, God doesn't need our help. Like he uses fools to confound the wise. We are fools, (laughs) but his word is, is perfect. His word is true. And uh, and his message is love and grace, and he does have an instruction manual, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. So don't lean on our own understanding. So that also means we need to lean not on our own interpretation of what God's word is saying. It's good as it is. I want to ask you though, with this strength that you have in your faith, I ask every one of my guests, and this is slightly off topic, but I want the listeners to get to know you through this question. And I ask every guest what their blue couch story is. And what I mean by that is at 13 years old, I asked Jesus into my heart watching a Billy Graham crusade. And it was a pivotal moment for me as a preacher's kid where I went from a guy, who I, I was a kid thinking I'd get to heaven because I was in the family business. But there was something that took place in that moment on the blue couch 
where it, my faith became real to me. I know and I could tell in one conversation with you, even listening to one of your podcasts, having never met you, that your faith is real to you. But that has to start somewhere. And so I love asking each guest if they can think back in a moment. And there's probably many blue couch moments like that where your faith is real to you all along the way and you keep going deeper and deeper and God shows you that he's still with you. But can you remember that first moment where something clicked in your head and your heart and maybe even you said a prayer, that first moment where your faith became real to you and has led you to who you are today? Yeah, it's kind of like what you said. It's sometimes a series of little moments and I'm sure that there was one distinct moment where I thought that, but when I look back, it's more seasons of my life. I can think back to my junior year of high school when my faith became something that was my own when I started going to the church that I wanted to go to and not the church that my parents raised me in. Nothing wrong with that. I'm glad to have been raised a Christian, but realizing that faith was more than just asking Jesus into my heart and walking down the aisle and getting baptized, that's all well and good, but realizing that it's for something. Um, it's not just for me, but it's also compels me to be something and to do something. It compels me to be a disciple of Christ, which then inspires me to obedience. It inspires me to serve other people. It inspires me to speak truth. It's not just, okay, I got this insurance policy and I'm not going to hell. And so now I can, you know, keep doing what I want to do. But realizing when I was probably 17 or 18 years old, that this means something that if like God changed my life. If it really is like this old self, new self deal, it's not just a uh, like kind of like mediocre self and a better self or a bad self and a good self. But if I'm like, a, if I'm a new person and I have a new heart, like if I had a heart of stone and I was a corrupted old self and now I'm a new self with a regenerate and soft heart, then that has to mean something. Like I'm going to act in a different way. I think that that probably started around high school. It was not um, a clear path from A to B. This is something that I talk about in my book. I had different seasons of doubt and wrestling and struggling when I was in college, different seasons of different sins, different temptations, different I had an eating disorder that I struggled with in college. And so I talk about a lot about my testimony mm. there. But the theme, and I think it's all of, it's every single Christian's theme is that, wow, I can look back at my testimony in the past, you know, 15 years of my life or so and say, I messed up so much. There were so many times when God could have let go. There are so many times when I said that I trusted God and I didn't actually trust God. When I said that I have faith and I didn't act like I had faith, when I was acting one way in front of other people and I wasn't really living like that behind the scenes and God's relentlessness and his pursuit of me, his faithfulness when I was faithless, his grace when I was not good, that has been the theme of my life. Certainly the theme since I've been in high school and um, he's held on to me. I mean, he's, he's kept me and that's always my prayer that God would keep me and he, he does. And so, yeah, I know that doesn't exactly answer your question because it's not a real moment. Um, it's lots of moments though. It's lots of moments. That's the beauty of the blue couch story is that everybody's is different. And I just love people hearing that because somebody out there listening right now is going, yeah, you know what, Matthew, you talk about a blue couch story or a blue couch moment. I've had lots of little moments that have led me to where I am. So they're relating to yours. And that's the beauty of it is that God is, he's uniquely pursuing each and every one of us. And so I love that. That's why I love asking that question because it also brings me back to like, some days you just feel like you're far away from those moments when your faith was just like on fire. You know what I right, mean? Right. And and I don't think God's plan for us is that, like you said, that we get this insurance policy at one point in our life and then we go on living our lives and it's not a fire burn and it's just the flames gone out. And I write a lot about that. I write a yeah. lot about going through the motions in our lives and wanting to break free from that and discover life to the fullest. Lastly, speaking of that, I've got a song on the radio right now and it's called What If? And the idea is reaching the end of our lives with no regrets and no what ifs. Now, you can imagine the irony. You can imagine the irony when I release a song called Modest is Hottest. We're going through this summer where I'm encouraging all my listeners, hey, let's make this a summer of no what ifs. We're going to run our race with perseverance, no regrets. We're going to live for Jesus. We're going to be bold. Then I get pummeled with criticism. And then I pull this song and I like crumble and feel like so much like, I feel shame. I feel like I've let people down. I feel like I've offended people. And all of a sudden, I'm riddled with what ifs. Like, what if I had done this differently? What if I had done that differently? 
what would you encourage? I mean, I usually say, how would you encourage listeners? Shoot, I need some encouragement today. How would you encourage somebody to live their life with no regrets and no what ifs, even if they're trying to get back up after a discouraging or disappointing season? Yes. So we all have different what ifs. We have some people have a lot of little small what ifs. Some people have really big what ifs in their life. What if I had just made that one choice differently? Would my entire life be better or different? And yes, we all make mistakes. I'm not going to say that, uh, you know, we've never made a mistake that we should regret. I think another movement today that we should never regret anything. Of course, we regret things. We are guilty of things. We sin. We feel ashamed of our sin, all of that. But allowing ourselves to kind of wallow in the self-pity that comes with staying in the past and staying in those what-ifs, I think is a tactic of Satan not to move us forward. Because if God, I remember C.S. Lewis explaining this, if God is like in the eternal now, so he is not you know, passing along linear time as we are, then he's not in the past. He's not in the future. Like he's in the eternal now. Like this is where the grace of God is, like where we exist right now. So the grace that we're, or the things that we're worried about in the future, the grace of God, we can't imagine yet because the grace of God hasn't covered that. The things that we're thinking of in the past have already passed. We have no control over that. The grace of God is in the here and the now. And that is where our focus has to be. And as difficult as that is to stay as present as possible, it also takes the grace of God for us to stay there. And the good thing is, is that God is completely and totally sovereign. Like the God who created the universe, his plan cannot be thwarted by a mistake that you make. Job 42, two says that his will cannot be thwarted. His plan is perfect. His sovereignty is absolutely sure and steadfast. And so whatever he wills, ultimately, he is going to accomplish. Like you cannot get in God's way. You just can't. He's bigger than that. So yeah, we make a lot of mistakes and we disobey, we rebel, we go the way that we're not supposed to go. But like you uh, quoted Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 earlier, um, we rely not on our own understanding. We do everything we do for the glory of God with the knowledge that he will make our paths straight, ultimately. I love it. That's awesome. Allie Beth Stuckey, your podcast uh, is called Relatable. It's phenomenal. And uh, people all over are listening to it like crazy. Your book is called You're Not Enough, and That's Okay, right? Yes, You're Not Enough, and That's Okay, Escaping the Toxic Culture of self-love. So that is a whole controversy in the title itself. That got some blowback as well? I mean, you know, same kind of people that would push back on on your song. There, you know, people have to read the book because obviously it's my book is not a call to self-loathing, but it is talking about how self-love has kind of become an excuse for narcissism and selfishness and really worship of self and how the self can't be both the problem and the solution. So if inside ourself, we're finding all of these issues, we're finding, you know, depression, doubt, anxiety, worry, insecurity, all of these things, the solution to those things isn't also going to be found inside of ourselves. We have to look outside of ourselves, namely to the God who made us. He is the one who is providing the satisfaction that we are trying and failing to find inside of ourselves. So That's what the book is about. It's not about pushing people to self-loathing. It's about pushing people to self-forgetfulness and remembrance of the God who made you. And you think about the scripture, you know, he lifted me up out of the muck and the mire, out of that, that, that pit. And uh, you think about the psalmist didn't say, I got myself out of that pit. Right. Right. <laughs> and exactly. uh, man, I love that. Well, I can't wait to read your book. I'm buying a copy of the book and I'm going to give it away to one of our listeners. And I want to encourage everybody to check out your podcast, Relatable, as well as your book. I'm going to post links to both of those things at the official podcast page, which is matthewwest.com slash podcast. Allie Beth Stuckey, this was almost a little bit of a counseling session for me too. So I feel like I need to, uh, do you have an hourly (laughs) rate? Uh, Yeah, I do. I'll, I'll email you. Okay. (laughs) I'm really thankful though, to have the chance to, to talk with you. And, you know, I just felt like it was the Lord that, you know, when I found your podcast is just something I heard about it. What I heard was truth 
And now what I'm getting to experience with you today, again, centers around that word truth. And that's one of the questions I'm going to encourage the listeners to walk away with this. I'm going to be doing the same thing is when I'm wondering, should I say that thing? Should I stand up for this thing? Just keep coming back to that question. Is it true? Lord, is it true? Is this, is this from you? Is this what you want me to do? And let him be the guide of our lives with both of how we use our words, but also how we raise our families and how we stand up for, for what we believe to be true. Not what our truth is, but what his truth is. So thank you for that reminder today. Thank you. Hey, that's our show for today. Thanks to Allie Beth Stuckey for joining me. Be sure to check out her podcast, Relatable, and her latest book. We're going to post a link to it at matthewwest.com slash podcast. And you know what? I want to give a copy of her book away right now to one of our most faithful podcast listeners. Nicole Driggs is out there. She came to a show in Tennessee recently, um, made a road trip, and I know that she's out there listening week in and week out. So Nicole, we're going to send you your very own copy of Allie Beth Stuckey's latest book. And the message of that book is something that we all got to take with us. I love how empowering this message is. You are not enough right? It doesn't sound like it would be empowering, but it's pointing us to the reminder that the answers we need do not lie within. The strength we need to stand does not lie within us. Contrary to popular and public opinion, we know that true strength is found when we look outside of ourselves and we realize that we can't make it through this life without Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. May you be challenged today just from Allie and what she shared just to open your Bible, to know scripture. Don't point to your truth. Let go of what you think your truth is and focus on what the truth is, what God's truth is. And this is the truth. He's made you. He's put you here on this earth for a reason. Your life is a story. He's the author and perfecter of your story. And it's your story for his glory. Thanks for letting me share my heart today about Modest is Hottest. I love you guys. I'm so thankful for your support. And I love doing this podcast every week. I'll see you next week. Seriously, I, I, I do.